Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast This Week in America. Great to have you with us on the program today. As mentioned, we're talking about the new book, Blood Brother, Jonathan Daniels and the Sacrifice for Civil Rights, a true story of activism and sacrifice, written by Rich Wallace and Sandra Neal Wallace. Rich has written more than three dozen novels for children and teenagers. His first novel, Wrestling Sturbridge, was selected as one of the 100 best of the best for the 21st century. His acclaimed middle grade nonfiction, Babe Conquers the World, is co-written by his wife, Sandra Neal Wallace, also co-author of the book Blood Brother. Sandra had a long career as a news anchor and ESPN sportscaster, became the first woman to host an NHL show on network TV, and part of the first ever ESPN crew to cover the WNBA before co-writing Babe Conquers the World and the award-winning fiction titles Muckers and Little Joe. And they're with us on This Week in America. Rich, Sandra, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Oh, it's great to be here, Rick. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. This is such an important book, and let's talk about how really it came about. It's fascinating. You just moved to, to Keene, New Hampshire, and you find there's this local hero there, and after a while, what you realize, this is really a story that needs to be told nationally. It's a story that's bigger than just New England. This has to be a national story. Talk about exactly who, who Jonathan is. It's, it's a fascinating story. Well, as you said, Jonathan was an activist in uh, 1965 in March after Bloody Sunday occurred in Selma, Alabama, where marchers led by John Lewis were beaten by sheriff's officers and, and police officers as they tried to march um, to protest um, the lack of voting rights and opportunities for, for black uh, citizens of that area. Um, after that debacle occurred, Martin Luther King Jr. made a call for clergy from the North to come South to assist with voting rights, uh, specifically for white clergy to come down. Jonathan was a seminarian at the time. He heeded King's call and uh, got on a plane immediately and, and flew to Selma. One of the reasons, Rick, that I wanted to write the book is because I didn't know that a white civil rights worker like Jonathan went to Selma and became embedded in the voting rights campaign. And we quickly discovered that a narrative that's been missing in the civil rights movement of the 1960s is really the voice of young people, college students like Jonathan who left school, and Selma High School students who put their schooling on hold to protest for their parents' right to vote. You know, and that's one of the interesting aspects of Blood Brother is the fact that there were these these teenagers there that really fought, protested for their parents so they would have the right to vote. And, and you're right, at least in my recollection of history and growing up during that period, I was not aware of that movement going on. Well, you know, the thing is, you mentioned the high school students, and there were many of them. And one of the key aspects of research for our book was cracking a couple of dozen of those kids down, kids who are now well into their 60s, who, who stood side by side with Jonathan. They, they left school at R.B. Hudson High School in Selma and stood on the protest lines day after day or went out and did other activities. And Jonathan joined them, got to know them very well, and we tracked them down, uh, you know, half a century later, and they were overwhelmingly happy to talk about their experiences with Jonathan. Rick, it was interesting how we discovered them in the first place. We realized that Jonathan was an amateur photographer, and with the photographs that were developed from his camera after he was he was killed in August of 1965, we realized that we had this visual account of what it was like to be embedded as an activist in Selma, Alabama in 1965. And we were really determined to identify the, the people in the photos, the African-American teenagers that protested with Jonathan. And when we did, their stories really added to the heft of the book. We're talking about the new book, Blood Brother, Jonathan Daniels and a Sacrifice for Civil Rights. The authors are Rich Wallace and Sandra Neal Wallace with us on This Week in America. The book is available all across the country. Information on the book, and you can link directly and find out about the book at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Jonathan is really interesting. You describe him as a rebel and a thinker. He was such a rebel that he preferred Beethoven over the Beatles. That was unheard of back in the, in the mid-1960s. Well, yeah, that was his stance while he was in high school, and as far as we know, that continued. <laughs> Always a bit different than his peers, but he was not, you know, strange to them or anything like that. But he always kind of stood out for his eccentricities and the things that he enjoyed culturally, and also because he was always standing up for people who were, you know, less uh, fit in less well maybe than he did. 
And it's interesting. It really that he... wasn't of injustice from the beginning. And growing up in Keene, New Hampshire, it was more um, ethnic discrimination and class economic discrimination. There were the mill workers on one side of Keene and the Italians on another side of Keene. And yeah, he was the son of a, of a, of a wealthy uh, physician. And class lines, he broke through all of that. Jonathan had the, the ability to cut through racial cultural and social barriers to really the humanity in all of us. And that really resonated with the black community that he was embedded with when he arrived in Selma. He went to VMI, which surprised a lot of his friends and family that he would choose VMI to go to. And, and there he became he, he came face to face with, with racism. Talk about the impact that, that VMI, that part of his life, had on, on shaping who he, who he is, who he was. You know, it really did surprise a lot of people. But when you look at the history, you know, his his ancestors had fought in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War. His father had served and been injured during World War II. So there was a history of military involvement uh, in his in his background. And I think, you know, the, the reason he said he went to VMI was because he felt that he needed more discipline. He'd been not the best student in the world. He'd been, you know, the kinds of trouble that kids get in in middle school and high school. And um, he felt to, to achieve the sorts of things he wanted to in life, he needed more discipline, more self-discipline. He figured, uh, you know, a stint at a military college would bring that on. He actually didn't like it very much at VMI when he, when he arrived, but he wound up being valedictorian of his class. Just to sort of show his mindset back then, this was well before the days of uh, of Kaepernick. But he would what he would not sing the la- the last line of the Star Spangled Banner. That's true because he didn't feel that we were all free, and uh, you know, he he recognized that as an early age, and he he set his life toward trying to correct that. Let's talk about how bad things were, especially for the white freedom fighters in, in, in Selma and in the South in general in 1965. This was a very dangerous place, wasn't it? And he decided to, to stay there and to, to register people to vote. Well, not only was it dangerous for white civil rights workers, but all civil rights workers, black and white. But I think perhaps when he was in Lowndes County, Alabama, known as Bloody Lowndes, one of the most dangerous counties in Alabama, and he became the first white civil rights workers to be in the voting rights campaign there, perhaps it was even more dangerous for him because he insisted in, on wearing a seminarian collar, a clerical collar, because at that time, churches were segregated in the South. He was an Episcopalian, and he really wanted to be a physical example of a different kind of church, an inclusive church. So here was Jonathan, uh, known as uh, an outside agitator during the week, being on the front lines, and then, you know, in the faces of segregationists on Sunday, really seven days a week, to show them that uh, he was against segregation and he wasn't going away. Yeah, he really didn't have a lot of white allies in central Alabama because, as Sandra said, the churches were segregated, and he made a point of trying to integrate the Episcopal Church in Selma. He would go every Sunday with a group of, of black friends and um, try to get in. Eventually they were able to sit in the back row um, but it, w- it was it was a constant struggle in, in that regard. So, yeah, he was he was certainly um, someone who was uh, singled out, partly because of you know his color and partly because of his his need to or his, his desire to, as Sandra said, show a different side of of his faith. And Rick, he refused to be intimidated. As a matter of fact. When he first went to Selma, he had uh, a friend's Volkswagen, a Red Beetle, um, that he was used sometimes um, as, as what he would call a getaway car uh, to elude night riders who were chasing him, and then he immediately got a faster car. He rented a white Plymouth Fury by the time he was in Lowndes County. Yeah, he had to get a faster car to try to get away from the people that, that, that were after him. I mean, it's an amazing story. It's Blood Brother, Jonathan Daniels, and his sacrifice for civil rights. The co-authors Rich Wallace and Sandra Neal Wallace with us on This Week in America. Information on the book available, of course, at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. You can link on directly for that information. book is available all across the country. Talk about the relationship, which is interesting, with, with Stokely Carmichael. And the two of them would, would be out together, and I understand would, like, get hungry and, and go into the fields and grab some vegetables while they were out trying to register voters. Yeah, that was when they became friends and when Stokely finally accepted Jonathan into the 
core of people who were who were working for vote, voting rights, canvassing with share out, out looking talking to sharecroppers in Lowndes County. Prior to that, though, Stokely was highly resistant to having Jonathan involved. Um, Stokely was the head of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Lowndes County, which, as Sandra said, was the bloodiest county in America at that time, a real hotbed of the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council. And Stokely feared, A, for Jonathan's own safety as a, as a white uh, civil rights worker in that area, but also Stokely himself was had certainly had strong tendencies toward black nationalism, and he wasn't, he wasn't very welcoming of Jonathan at first. Jonathan really worked hard to win him over. And then they became close friends. Uh, uh, Stokely said that he met several white civil rights workers that year, but only one that he liked very much. And uh, together, when they both arrived at Lounge, they were both considered outside agitators. In March of 1965, zero blacks were registered to vote uh, because of corruption. And by mid-August, uh, they'd assisted in getting 1,000 African Americans registered to vote. This is in a county where 80% of the population was black, most of them sharecroppers, and not a single black vote had ever been cast in, in an election. It's amazing the impact that Jonathan had, and we're rapidly running out of time, but we will let's take it up to, uh, to uh, August, uh, I believe it was, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, 1965. Yeah, at, at Hainville Jail. Talk about what happened there and things happened rapidly and and changes came about because of this. Jonathan had participated in a protest about 20 black teenagers, Jonathan and a Catholic priest, um, and in uh, Fort Deposit, um, Alabama, a small town. Um, Stokely was there as well, although Stokely didn't exactly participate in the protest, but he was among those who were arrested called to jail. They were taken to jail in the back of a garbage truck to a larger jail than the one in Fort Deposit up in Hainville. They were then jailed on fairly trumped-up charges for six days in horrendous conditions. There were overflowing toilets, no running water. It was the hottest week of the summer. There were no fans. It was just really unlivable conditions for six days. And then, um, to their surprise, they were released um, on a on an afternoon in Hainville, um, no one was there to post bail or meet them, so they were kind of suspicious about what might happen. And um, within minutes, Jonathan was gunned down by um, a deputy sheriff and uh, in cold blood, and uh, the other priest was shot and other people were shot at. Yeah, Jonathan died saving the life of an African-American colleague of his, an activist by the name of Ruby Sales. And she, as I understand it, really didn't even want to leave the jail. She sensed something was wrong. This doesn't just happen. We're being set up for something. She really was apprehensive, wasn't she? Very true. I think they all felt that, but they were forced off jail property. This was, Ruby says it was a setup, and all the evidence points to that it was, that, uh, Tom Coleman, the man who killed Jonathan, knew full well what was happening and where they were likely to go when they were released from jail because there was only one small store about a block away where they could get a cold drink. And they'd been denied their right to phone calls. And when they were released and and saw immediately that they hadn't been bailed out and and their colleagues weren't there to pick them up, uh, they desperately uh, knew at that point that, that... was wrong. But at that point, they hadn't had much to eat or drink for a week and, and were uh, went to the corner store to get something to, to eat and to drink, and Tom Coleman was waiting for them. It's interesting. There's such research, extensive research in the book Blood Brother, Jonathan Daniels and a Sacrifice for Civil Rights. The trial was a travesty, to put it mildly. The jury took an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, some great reporting at the time. Jack Nelson, one of my favorite reporters ever from the L.A. Times, and you've done a great job of, of covering the trial there. But out of this came uh, a really interesting character, an attorney, Charles Morgan, who was very upset at what happened. Talk about his role in this, because he went forward where nobody had gone before, and really we, we started to see some changes. Yeah, Rick. Well, after Jonathan's killer was acquitted by an all-male, all-white jury, 
not only were Americans outraged, but like you said, journalists spoke out. Uh, Charles Morgan got involved. An incredible thing happened along with Charles Morgan, Connie Daniels, who was Jonathan's mother, together with a group of black residents of Lowndes County, sued the Lowndes County judicial system for illegal jury practices, and they won. Within a year of Jonathan's death, blacks and women of all races were on juries in Alabama. Women weren't allowed to be on juries at that time in Alabama in 1965. They could be judges, but they couldn't be on juries. And then other states in this battle followed suit, so it really became a landmark case. What would you like readers to take away from this? I'm reading this, and, and it's a book of uh, of courage. It's a, Well, in fact, Jonathan said, I cannot stand by in benevolent dispassion any longer without compromising everything I know and love and value. As people read the book Blood Brother, what do you want them to take away from this? Because I look at some of the pictures there, and I can sort of see them reflected in in modern news stories now with with the problems we've got going on around the country. Yeah, you know, you look at the front cover of the book, which was taken in 1965 by Bob Adelman in, in a protest where um, black and white protesters are standing toe to toe, face to face with uh, with sheriff's department representatives, and it's a photo that you know looks exactly like photos you see today taken in Ferguson or Baton Rouge or St. Paul or any other place across the country where these sorts of uh, things are going on. The, the takeaway would be that you know we really can work together, uh, you know, toward for peaceful change in America, and it's desperately needed right now. And what? Jonathan was to die, Rick, for the right of every American to vote freely. Yes. And, you know, the vote is the most powerful expression we have to uphold our democracy. So, you know, when you think that it's too cold or too wet or inconvenient to vote, vote anyway. We got about a minute or so left in the program. You went about the book, and so often people will write a book. They'll do a little research, and then and they'll write from that research. You actually walk through a lot of the steps that Jonathan walked through. You sat in churches where Jonathan sat. What kind of impact has this had on on both of you? you because you basically sort of went back and sort of retraced his life, going through his footsteps. Yeah, we did. You know, again, we, there are people here in Keene who went to kindergarten with Jonathan all through school. We spoke to them. We visited all the places, his home and church and such here, and then headed south and, and walked across the Pettus Bridge and visited Brown Chapel, all that kind of firsthand research. I, I definitely has, has upped my own feelings about working towards social justice um, as using Jonathan as a model. And, you know, I can't think of a more meaningful way to incorporate investigative journalism than it, it, to discover stories like this, um, you know, that have to do with social justice. And every day we walk by Jonathan's uh, birth home here in Keene. It's just five-minute walk from where we live. And, you know, I think when, when we saw what he went through in Alabama, and we actually were able to sit in the very jail cell where he and Stokely Carmichael and others sat for, for those six days. And it, it really does change you and motivate you to uh, really appreciate your freedom and the power of the vote. It is a powerful book, an important book. It's called Blood Brother, Jonathan Daniels and a Sacrifice for Civil Rights, a true story of activism and sacrifice, written by Rich Wallace and Sandra Neal Wallace, our guest on This Week in America. Book is available all across the country. Information available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Rich Sandra, excellent job on the book. It, uh, like I said, it's a very important book. People do need to read it, and I really appreciate you coming on the program today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick, for helping us spread the word about Jonathan and about the book. We really appreciate it, Rick. You're welcome. Again, information on the book Blood Brother, Jonathan Daniels, and a Sacrifice for Civil Rights, available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Book available all across the country. You're listening to This Week in America, website thisweekinamerica.us. Back after these messages. <laughs> 